Hello friends, today we are going to talk about occipital bone. It is morphologically a flat bone. It is a curved plate of bone, concave internally and somewhat trapezoid in outline. Occipital is the posterior part of the vault and part of the base of the skull. Now the occipital has three parts. A flat squamous part, two condylar part and a basilar part. The demarcating line between the basilar part and the condylar part is the anterior one third and posterior two third of the occipital condyle and the demarcating line between the squamous part and the condylar part passes between the between the uh, posterior end of the occipital condyle now we come to the squamous part the squamous part had has two two surfaces an external surface and internal surface it has four borders two superior border two inferior lateral border it has three angles a superior angle and two lateral angles now we come to the external surface the external surface of the squamous bone is marked by an external occipital protuberance and the most prominent part of the external occipital protuberance is called the union this is the union now two line two curved line extends bilaterally from the union and it is curved upwards this, these are called the superior nuchal line. If a, another two lines are directed laterally and arches above the superior nuchal line, these are called the highest nuchal line. A line extends from the union to the foramen magnum directed, and it is directed downwards. This is called the external occipital crest. At the midpoint of the external occipital crest, Two lines are directed laterally, and these lines are called inferior, uh, inferior nuchal line. Now we come to the internal surface. In the internal surface, this is the internal occipital protuberance. Four cruciate arrangement of lines or sulcus are radiate from the internal occipital protuberance. This is the sagittal sulcus, and it contains superior sagittal sinus. These two are the transverse sulcus and they contain transverse, transverse sinus uh, from the inf uh, in internal occipital protuberance a line extends downwards towards the foramen mag magnum this is the internal occipital crest it contains the occipital sulcus occipital sinus now, come, now we come to the attachment of the external surface now the superior nuchal line is a very important landmark it is the demarcating line between the scalp and the neck and it gives adjustment to the investing layer of deep cervical fascia. The superior nuchal line gives adjustment to the strapezius medially and sternocleidomastoid laterally. The, st uh, the trapezius, is or a trapezius is originated from here and the sternocleidomastoid is uh, in gives insertion in here. And below the sternocleidomastoid there is an insertion of splenius capitis. Now we come to the highest nuchal line. The highest nuchal line gives attachment to the attachment to the gallia aponeuticum medially and occipital belly of occipital frontalis laterally. The area below the superior nuchal line and the area above the inferior nuchal line. This area. Medially, this area gives attachment to the semispinalis cap semispinalis capitis medially and obliquus capitis superior laterally. The area below the inferior nuchal line gives adjustment to the rectus capitis posterior minor medially and rectus capitis posterior major laterally. Now I come to the internal surface. The two margins of the superior sagittal side sulcus gives adjustment to the fox cerebri and the two leaves of the transverse sulcus gives adjustment to the the two leaves of the transverse sulcus gives adjustment to the Tentorium cerebelli and the lips of the internal occipital crest gives attachment to the fox cerebelli. Now, in the internal surface, the squamous part is divided into four areas by this cruciate arrangement. The upper two triangular area is occupied by the occipital lobes of the cere occipital lobes of the cerebellar hemis cere cerebral hemisphere and the lower two quadrilateral area is occupied by the cerebellar hemispheres 
now that now the two superlateral borders these borders are seated and they articulate with the posterior border of the parietal bone and forms half of the lambdoid suture now the inferolateral border or the mastoid border they form the they are seated for the articulation with the posterior border of the mastoid part of corresponding temporal bones now we come to the three angles superior angle and two lateral angle the superior angle is the meeting point of the sagittal and lambdoid sutures and it is known as lambda or posterior frontonelli and the two lateral angles these angles are the meeting point of the occipital parietal and mastoid part of temporal bone and it is known as asterion it is also called the posterior frontonelli which is present in fetal skull now we come to the basilar part and this is the basilar part and it extends forwards and upwards from the posterior margin of the foramen magnum and it has three surfaces and two borders this is the superior surface this is the anterior surface this is the inferior surface and these are the two lateral borders now I come to the anterior surface this is the anterior surface it is quadrilateral and rough and it articulates by plate of hyaline cartilage with the posterior surface of the body of the sphenoid bone it forms a primary cartilaginous joint which is replaced by plate of bone in about 25 years now I come to the inferior surface this is the inferior surface and it faces uh, upwards and forwards it is faces downwards and forwards and it is presents by a pharyngeal tubercle this is the pharyngeal tubercle and it gives adjustment to the fibrous raphi which is attached with the strong constrictor, mu constrictor muscles of the pharynx yeah, and it slides one centimeter uh, in front of the foramen magnum in front of the pharyngeal tubercle there are three fascia which are uh, which are attached from before backwards prevertebral fascia buccopharyngeal fascia and pharyngobasilar fascia and which is covered by mucoparaestrium and this part forms the roof of the posterior wall of the nasopharynx now in both sides of the pharyngeal tubercle there is a slight depression which gives insertion to the longus capitis these are the depressed area and they gives uh, adjustment to the longus capitis and just in front of the occipital condyles it gives adjustment to the rectus cavitis anterior now this is the superior surface it forms a shallow gutter which slopes downwards and backwards from the basis phenoid to form and magnum and it forms a part of the clevis the surface supports the pons and upper part of medulla oblongata which is separated by basilar artery and the basilar plexus of veins close to the anterior margin of the foramen magnum three membranes are attached from above downwards they are membrana tectoria upper band of cruciate ligament and apical ligament and they pass later they pass through the foramen magnum now i come to the lateral borders each of the lateral borders articulates with the medial part of the posterior border of the petrous part of temporal bone by sutural ligament and a, here is a fine groove is, is a, this is the groove and it gives lodgement to the inferior petrous sinus and it is the first tributary of the internal jugular vein now i come to the condylar parts this is the condylar part and it is divided into two parts the condylar part proper, proper and the jugular process this is the condylar part proper this is the condylar part proper and this is the jugular process now we come to the condylar part proper the inferior surface of the condylar part proper presents an obliquely placed and convex articular surface it it is the occipital condyles and it articulates with the lateral mass of the atlas forming the atlanto occipital joint which is an ellipsoid variety of synovial joint and above the occipital condyles there is an canal called hypoglossal canal this is the hypoglossal canal the occipital condyles 
condyle bridges over the bridges below the hypoglossal canal and it transmits the hypoglossal nerve meningeal branch of ascending pharyngeal artery and sometimes emissary veins and just behind the occipital condyles there is a shallow depression called the condylar fossa these are the condylar fossa uh, these are present here for the accommodation of the upturned posterior margin of the superarticular facet of the atlas during full at extension of the head the condylar fossa sometimes transmits an emissary vein connecting the sigmoid sinus with the suboccipital venous plexus uh, you can see this is the canal and it transmits an emissary vein now i come to the superior surface this is the superior surface of the condylar part proper and it is marked by an jugular tubercle this is the jugular tubercle and it bridges over the hypoglossal canal and uh, post just posterior to the jugular tubercle there is a faint groove uh, you can see there is a faint groove here and it it lodges the glossopharyngeal nerve vagus nerve and accessory nerve through the and they pass through the intermediate compartment of the jugular foramen which we will discuss later now these are the jugular process they are directed laterally and they are a quadrilateral plate plates of bones and it has two surfaces an upper surface a lower surface and two borders and anterior border and two lateral borders now the anterior border it is curved and it forms the jugular notch which forms the posterior part of the jugular foramen and it uh, transmits the internal jugular vein which is a continuation of the sigmoid sinus now the lateral borders the lateral borders are rough and it forms a primary cartilaginous joint with a petrous part of temporal bone which usually is replaced by a plate of bone after 25 years now we come to the superior surface or upper surface the upper surface is marked by a groove which lodges the sigmoid sinus which then later continues as internal jugular vein now we come to the inferior surface or lower surface the lower surface is rough and it uh, gives insertion to the rectus capitis later lateralis now we come to the foramen magnum it is oval in outline and uh, we discussed about the alar ligament previously the alar ligament is attached here and the alar ligament divides the foramen magnum into two compartments this is the anterior the in front of the alar ligament is the anterior small compartment and the posterior part of the alar ligament divides the foramen magnum into posterior large compartment now the anterior compartment is called osseo ligamentous compartment it is it is because uh, the structure passing through the anterior compartments are from before backwards apical ligament occasionally tip of dense upper band of cruciate ligament and membrana tectoria and they extend from the inferior surface of the be uh, basio occiput or the basilar part now we come to the posterior compartment posterior compartment is also called it the neurovascular compartment because the structure following structure passes through it they are the lower part of medulla oblongata and uh, with meninges fourth part of vertebral artery surrounded by sympathetic plexus of nerves the spinal root, root of accessory nerves and the anterior and posterior spinal arteries and occasionally tonsil of the cerebellum projecting on each side of the brain stem so this is why it is called the neurovascular compartment because mainly vessels and the brain stem or the lower part of the brain stem passes through here now the anterior margin and the posterior margin of the foramen magnum gives attachment to the at anterior atlanto occipital membrane and posterior atlanto occipital membrane and the midpoint of the foramen magnum is known as basion once an interesting topic about the occipital bone is the ossification the area above the supranuchal line ossifies from membrane and the area below the supranuchal line ossifies from cartilage so that this part is formed by membranous ossification and this part is formed by cartilaginous ossification now we come to the anatomical position for anatomical position we must fold the bone like this 
and we must set the following anatomical points. The foramen magnum lies horizontally and it is directed downwards, vertically downwards. And the basilar part, it is directed upwards and forwards. And the internal, surf internal surface of the squamous part is concave. So this is the anatomical position and this is all I have to say about the occipital bone and for occipital bone. For further information about the occipital bone, you can comment in the com comment box below or post in the calcium BD study group in Facebook. And if you like this video or find any it useful, then please like, press like button or subscribe to the channel.